have you here again. Uh, we are starting with our new season of uh, uh, Welcome uh, to NASC at NASC's uh, seminar. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to introduce uh, to you uh, our today's guests, uh, Professor uh, Amir Patel from University of uh, Cape Town. Um, Amir is uh, uh, Associate Professor at the um, Department, Department of Electrical Engineering at Cape Town University and also visiting professor at the Department of uh, Computer Science at Oxford University. He's a recipient of numerous awards. Uh, I will mention a few, few of them. Uh, Google Research Award, uh, twice Oppenheimer Fellowship, and uh, National Science, uh, uh, National Research Award for Emerging uh, Scientists, uh, and so on. Uh, for his wonderful, he's awarded for his wonderful uh, work on robotics and uh, studying uh, wonderful uh, uh, animals, uh, cheetahs. Uh, um, and he's also leader of uh, African uh, Robotics uh, Unit. Uh, I first met Amir at uh, MathWorks Research Summit in Natick uh, this year, and uh, from the, the very first moment uh, I heard him, I knew immediately uh, that I have to have uh, Amir here uh, at NASC. He's a wonderful speaker, great scientist. I'm very happy, Amir, uh, you uh, accepted my invitation. Uh, welcome to NASC. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miha. Um, it's a, a great pleasure to be here for my first time ever in Poland and in Warsaw, especially. So thank you, thank you so much for, for having me. Um, so, so today I'm going to be talking about my work that we do at, uh, at the African Robotics Unit at the University of Cape Town. And it's sort of a culmination of, I would say, you know, almost 12 years of research um, that I've been doing since my PhD. So today we're going to talk about how I've been studying cheetahs through the lens of robotics, or I like to think of it of how I accidentally became a biologist. <laughs> um, so. I always like to start off with sort of the main goal here is I want to make robots more agile and autonomous, right? So things like jumping, acceleration, turning are all going to be critical for robots if they're ever to leave the safety of the lab, right? So the world outside is unstructured and often robots need to respond immediately um, to things that they couldn't plan for, right? And maneuverability or agility is quite interesting because it has a set of competing requirements. So we obviously want to be safe, right? So we want to not fall over or break something when you do a maneuver. You want to use the least amount of energy when you do that. So obviously you don't want to use your entire battery in order to make a turn or stop. You obviously need to be robust because uh, any kind of maneuver usually happens when things are unplanned or unexpected and you want to be agile, right? So these things are kind of competing requirements, so we need to trade them off. But they're actually quite sparsely studied in the robotics literature. So we have quite a, a good vocabulary of things like steady state motion, such as we know about walking, we know about running in animals, we know things like trotting and galloping. So we have sort of the tools to speak about these things, but not so much on, on maneuvers. But animals are really incredible at this, and we cannot um, for a second think that our robots are at the level yet of, of what uh, animals can do. And it's because it's really been, it's been honed over you know, thousands of, actually, sorry, millions of years of evolution for survival. So no animal epitomizes maneuverability quite like the cheetah. So I always like to start with this, because this is what inspired me this is some of the videos we took um, up at the Cheetah Sanctuary out in Johannesburg in South Africa. So really, really incredible motion. You can see, you know, lots of sliding and dust and um, really unplanned maneuvers that need to take place. So how can we make our robots do that? So what do we know about the cheetah? I think you all know from various uh, <laughs> watching TV or reading books that the cheetah is the fastest terrestrial animal. We also know that its hunting success is actually not because it runs fast all the time, but its ability to rapidly change uh, its velocity. So either decelerating, so stopping really quickly, or changing its direction as fast as possible. 
I put down some facts here, and I say facts because these are things that people often say about the cheetah. So they say things like the cheetah tail is used uh, because it has high inertia, it's heavy. Um, any game ranger in South Africa or in a zoo anywhere in the world will say things like it's used as a rudder or stabilizer, but we actually don't have any, uh, anything, any studies to confirm that. So when I started my PhD back in 2012, um, my idea was that I was going to look at biology and I was going to build the next, you know, agile robot uh, seen over there. And I was going to do that building off what was done by biologists. So using bioinspiration or biomimicry, you know, use all the data being collected by biologists, using all the models and the understanding in order to build this system. But to my dismay, no such data was in existence at the time. Right? So I thought, could I use my knowledge as a roboticist, as an engineer, to provide insight to biology. And that's sort of what we do in my research unit. We use uh, the cheetah as a model animal for understanding maneuverability, and we study it across these different sort of directions. So we look at multi-body modeling, so mechanical modeling, kinematics, dynamics. We look at feedback control. Um, we do lots of optimization, optimal control. We're starting to do some reinforcement learning now. We build physical robots to help us understand mechanisms. And then we do quite a bit, which I'll talk about, on computer vision and also state estimation and machine learning. So back to my PhD. So in 2012, I, 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 I built this robot called Dima. It comes from a Sutu word called Leha Dima, which means flash of lightning. Um, and the idea was that it was a mechanical model, because there was no such data from animals, for us to understand how the tail is used. And we tested it. I watched lots of wildlife documentaries, and we saw three motion primitives. So we saw sometimes the cheetah swung its tail in the roll axis, sometimes in the pitch, so straight up, and then also sometimes yaw, so from in this kind of, this kind of way. So we wanted to figure out why, why was it doing that. So the first one is the roll axis, which I think many of you have seen that cool video where as the cheetah turns, you can see it's flicking the tail. And so what I built was a simple mechanical model to understand this. And what we saw is that when, a, when an animal or a robot is turning, there's a force that's trying to push it over, right? That centrifugal force, which you guys remember from, from physics back in school. And my idea was that the tail could be used to stabilize the body. And there's an example over here. This is the, the robot without the tail. And you can see it falls over. You can see that centrifugal force pushing it out of the turn. It's lovely when physics does what you think it's <laughs> supposed to do. And now we add a tail with a feedback controller. And you can see that was at three meters per second. Now we can turn it seven meters per second by flicking the tail. And even at 7.5 meters per second, we were able to turn. So, so the tail could act as a disturbance rejector in order to perform high speed maneuvers. Then I, I, I managed to, you know, I got some GoPro cameras and we went down to one of the cheetah sanctuaries out in South Africa, put down some cameras and I was hoping to see cool turning maneuvers. And what we ended up seeing was actually a lot of these kinds of things. So here, when the lure suddenly stops, you'll see that the tail flicks in the pitch axis. So we wanted to kind of figure out like, why is it doing that? It didn't make sense at the time. And then again, we built a simple simulation model and we saw that Similarly, if you're riding a bicycle, you'll know if you lock one of your wheels, the front or the back, you'll end up toppling over. So maybe the tail could be used for that. And again, we built a physical model. This is the robot. There's an arrestor system that sort of pulls on the robot. And now with the tail, we are able to decelerate at twice the speed that we had before. Again, by flicking, flicking the tail. Then the last thing we saw was, there's a really cool video which shows this. So you can see that when the cheetah's turning sort of for longer durations, it's doing a combination of pitching and yawing. So it's sort of a conical motion that we saw in the videos. And I couldn't find anything on the literature on that. And I wondered why was it doing that? So I built a simple mechanical model again. And instead of saying that it's trying to do, you know, pitch or uh, you know, roll 
control, we gave it to an optimization algorithm and said, if you have a tail like this and you are turning, what should the tail do? And what was amazing is that you can see out of it popped a conical motion. So that is a mathematically optimal thing to do, which was sort of the first time I looked at optimization and I sort of have been hooked since then. Anyway, so back to the cheetah tail. So that was during my PhD. Um, as I said, considered a counterweight, heavy, things like that. And I built all my robots around the idea that the tail was heavy. Then in 2014, I was invited to an, uh, an autopsy of a cheetah that had died of natural causes at the National Zoological Gardens in South Africa. And I was horrified, but we found that the tail was way lighter than we expected. Actually, only 2% of the body mass, and most of its inertia was down at the base. Um, it did have quite a bit of muscles at the base, though, for actuating and swinging. Also, what I saw is once we, we took the fur off, the tail was really skinny. But if you look at any video or picture of a cheetah, you'll see that the tail is quite big and bulky. So then I thought, could the fur be doing something? And then what we did was we stuck a bunch of cheetah tail pelts in a wing tunnel in mechanical engineering, and we determined that the aerodynamics could actually benefit the cheetah. So you know all of this, uh, if you ever stick your arm out of the window in a moving car, that there's a lot of force that you can get. So if the cheetah's moving at such high velocities, it could use that to redirect its body and actually stabilize it. And what we found is that with aerodynamics, it actually makes the tail look like something which is twice as big without having to carry around all of the mass. Um, and then on my sabbatical in 2018 at Carnegie Mellon, we extended that to um, the Minotaur robot. You can see that it's doing a self-writing. So before, these kinds of motions were only possible with really heavy, sort of 10% of a body mass, whereas this is about 1% of the body mass of the tail. Also, very recently, we just submitted this to, um, to ICRA. We, we extended this to DEMA. So now we added an aerodynamic tail to, to DEMA. We did a bit more <laughs> Sorry, my student put that music on. <laughs> I forgot about that. But so yeah, you can see here's the robot without the tail again, falling over. And now we add an, a, a lightweight but aerodynamic tail. And you can see we can now flick and turn at twice the speed that we were able to before. So really, really cool stuff um, that we can now do with aerodynamics. OK. So we also spend a bit of time trying to figure out what is the optimal, so the best way to do maneuvers. And it's really challenging, as you can see on the right there. The cheetah is a multi-body. I know there's a lot of mathematicians in the audience, so they understand this. <laughs> hybrid dynamic system, right? So, you know, it can make or break contact. It can be, you know, two legs on the ground at the same time. One leg can be sliding. How does it know what's the best thing to do? So it's really challenging from that perspective. Contact order, you know, deciding left foot down first, right foot down next. Also, we can't assume things like periodicity, which make the problem a lot easier. So we turn to contact implicit optimization. So what we do is we cast the optimization problem to also include choosing the contact. So now the optimization algorithm, I won't go into the details. I can chat about this afterwards. But we made it much more accurate by using uh, a much higher order uh, polynomial on the dynamics. And this allows us to now, in an accurate way, be able to do contact implicit optimization. Besides all the math, I'll explain what this means with an example. So what that means is we can take a model. In this case, we have a biped, so a two-legged model. And it has a heel and a toe on each foot. And we can say, start at rest, standing upright, and then walk 10 meters, again, end standing upright. And for fun, we put a pit over there that you can't make contact with. And we give this to an optimizer, and we say minimize energy. And what's amazing is what pops out is this. We've told it nothing about walking and using heels and toes, but that is the energy optimal motion to do for this task. So that's quite cool um, with this framework. We've since extended this to handle uh, <laughs> inelastic, uh, partially elastic collisions. So one of my students 
um, made a, a skateboard ollie maneuver now with this kind of framework. So uh, that, was, that was pretty fun. Um, we've also used this framework to help us design robots. So um, we saw quite a few times when we when we visiting uh, the cheetah centers is that the cheetahs don't appear to be controlling the force on their limbs very finely. They're just trying to push off as hard as they can on the ground to accelerate. So then I thought, um, what if a robot could use such a mechanism where it doesn't have to finally control its leg, but just push off and kick as hard as it can? So we developed this robot called Kemba, and it's a hybrid pneumatic electric robot. So it has an, an electric actuator in the shoulder and hip, but also a pneumatic piston for pushing off really fast. And now we can do very simple just on-off control with a piston and end up with a rapid acceleration maneuver you'll see over there in a bit. And this is really simple control. It's just bang bang control and we can do a transient uh, maneuver like that. So, so pretty cool stuff. But by, by and large, where I spend most of my time is trying to understand what the real animal is doing. So obviously this would be great if the cheetah could stand on a treadmill and I could put <laughs> the cameras around it and you know, it would be very easy, but it's not possible because we're working with a wild, endangered animal, I should say as well. So there's a, there's a very limited amount of things that we can do to it. Um, ideally, what we want to do is put it in a biomechanics lab, right? So we'd want things like, you know, some of you may know Vicon or OptiTrack motion capture. Um, you know, in a biomechanics lab, we could measure muscle activity. So with EMG sensors, um, we could also measure how much force it's making on the ground. Um, you know, that's how we could normally do biomechanics. So how can we get to that point? So Generally, um, animals are tracked uh, in the wild with collars, I'm sure many of you know, um, with GPS and IMU collars, which are amazing, but they don't quite work for us because what they do is they take this animal with all this articulation, so you can see lots of motion of the legs and the spine, tail, and they effectively just reduce it to a flying axis system, right? So we don't know anything about how it achieved the maneuvers that it does. So the first thing I thought of what if we put more sensors on the animal? <laughs> so we developed this system, which is a harness, which we put on some of the captive bred cheetahs, um, which has IMU GPS, like usual, but also has two backwards facing cameras. Um, and then we combine that with uh, 3D kinematics and an extended Kalman filter. And then without having any external cameras, we can reconstruct the spine and tail motion of the cheetah. So you can see this is an example of a tail flick um, that we could reproduce. And if you ever want to know sort of what's it like to ride on the back of a <laughs> cheetah, this is what it looks like. So you can see over there, this is not sped up. You can see we managed to put some orange markers and stickers on the cheetah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, luckily, like there were a handful of them that were comfortable enough with us doing this, but eventually, even those that were like any cats, they just didn't want to do it anymore and just didn't want to run. So we had to think of a new way that was non-invasive, like we didn't want to touch the animal um, in any way possible. So um, we partnered with GoPro and they gave us lots of cameras and we stuck them down at the cheetah sanctuaries and observed cheetahs for three years at those two sanctuaries, Cheetah Outreach and Anne Van Dyke. Um, and every uh, few days the cheetahs chase a lure around a track, so just to sort of keep them enriched and keep them uh, uh, exercising. So uh, we, this is some of the examples of the videos that we got. Which should play... Here we go. So you can see... These are captive breed cheetahs, so they need to kind of convince them to run. <laughs> Sometimes they're not interested. So you can see there, there we go. You'll see some of them we were allowed to put markers on, but most were not.
Okay, so some really, really cool videos we got. But as some of you know, working computer vision, this is a really challenging problem. Um, so what some of the problems are we have different times of day. So you can see sometimes we're in the morning, sometimes we get in the evening. Changes the lighting conditions, different seasons. So in winter, lots of, uh, sorry, winter there's no rain. Um, the cheetah at the bottom right is pretty much the same color as the grass. Um, we also had different cheetahs. So you can see the one in the bottom left is a, is a variant of the cheetah called the king cheetah, where its spots are actually, they join and they actually become uh, stripes, you can see there. We also have angles and distances. So this is an uncooperative subject we're working with. So they're going to do the cool things very far away from us in the corner of the camera or really close up to the, these, we have no control over it. Lots of occlusion, so you can see the cheetah can bend its back legs all the way to the front. It can twist its spine, so we don't always have a view of all of the, the limbs. And what's worse is that most of them didn't have markers. Uh, and I know a lot of people say, why don't you just use the spots? But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's difficult when the cheetah is changing uh, scale so, so rapidly. Okay, so um, I partnered with some very smart people, Alexander and McKenzie, Mathis, who are now at EPFL. Uh, and, and we co-authored a paper for Nature Protocols on, on uh, Deep Lab Cut, which is a, a 2D pose convolutional neural network that can detect the pose, so the skeleton of the cheetah, in a video image. So how that works is we take the view of the cheetah in six views. So that's a, you can see that maneuver. So the network then labels the skeleton in each of the views, you can see there. So one network can do all of these views, which is quite amazing. And then we take all of that and we do reconstruction. Unfortunately, there's still quite a few outliers. So my students, shame, unfortunately I had to do 8,000 labels on these and still we you can see here we have lots of, lots of um, errors because it really was designed for working inside a lab environment. So if you, if you just naively do 3D reconstruction on that, it looks something like that, which if you squint, looks a bit like a cheetah, but not quite. <laughs> so I, w I wasn't too happy, so we, we then extended that. And the way that we extended that was to include information about the actual structure of the skeleton. Also things like, you know, that the elbow can't bend backwards and things like that. We also added temporal information. So when you have occlusion, so you're missing a marker in one frame, but you see it again in the, in the next frame, you can use that information um, for the optimization. So now that same maneuver you'll see here now looks like something that you'd get from a Vicon camera system, but outside, which I, I'm really proud of. So you, you get the full wireframe kind of skeleton. So we also released a full data set on this. So it's a really challenging computer vision benchmark that some people have been starting to play around with. Um, so all that data, you're welcome. Please go and check it out. Um, we also have quite a few people starting to look at it for reinforcement learning. So tra training robotic controllers um, using this um, really challenging data set. So now, uh, wh what are we going to do next? So, the f so I want you to look at this data and see, can I see something about the tail? So here's some examples of the video. So you see, you've seen that one a bit. There's some more. You can see lots of tail flicking. Really, really fast. Slow it down. So you can see there's definitely something happening with the tail. So we did a simple analysis just of the body and the, and the tail on its own. And we got, a, I'd say, a moderate correlation out between acceleration and angular velocity of the tail. It's not quite where I would like it to be. So how can we improve things even more? So the first thing is we want to look at more data. So in our, even though we have a massive data set that we've released, many of the videos can't be reconstructed because only one camera sees the cheetah in the far corner, you can see the, um, so we can't do reconstruction on that. So um, what, I thought, uh, what I thought of is what if we moved the cameras? So we tracked the cheetah as it was moving. And we developed a system which basically takes a webcam, we then do YOLO version four, which I guess is quite ancient right now, but we then find the bounding box of the cheetah and then we steer a, a camera towards it. So we track it as it's running and then we can do a reconstruction on that. So 
what that looks like is um, over here. There's my PhD student running. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see in the world frame, we are then able to reconstruct the skeleton even if the camera is moving. The same with a cheetah. You can see over there. So really, really cool. Next thing is what about other data? So we've done a lot of kinematics. So I guess in our group, we can capture what the cheetah is doing quite nicely, but we don't know how it does it yet. So how did it create such accelerations or maneuvers? We need to know things about kinetics, which is forces and torques, which we can't measure at the moment, at least up until, up until this point. So the, what we first did was we partnered with a biologist, uh, a very famous one called uh, Alan Wilson at the Royal Veterinary College. He managed to have some force plate data, cheetahs running in a zoo over a force plate. Um, we then combined that with our trajectory optimization framework. And now you'll see over here, we can estimate, for example, how much torque is on the shoulder as the, as the cheetah is running. So, so pretty, pretty cool. But what I really want to do is, because that's maybe 10 videos that we have, is collect more data on force, right? So how this is currently done in biomechanics or in biomedical engineering is that you have a force plate and you have a test subject and you tell the, the, the subject, I want you to do this particular maneuver or thing on the force plate. And the force plate is typically about 1.5 meters by, by 0.5 meters. And that's fine with humans. You can tell them what to do most of the time. Uh, but how do we get a cheetah to run exactly on a spot of ground that we care about? So very, very difficult. So I thought, what if I covered the area in force plates? Wouldn't that be cool, right? But I quickly learned that a force plate is about $50,000. <laughs> so that's, that's not going to happen. So what I did was I actually came up with a new way of measuring 3D force, which we patented. And we spun out the company, Asinotech, um, which is going to be uh, releasing in quarter one, I guess, next year, 3D force plates for sports science, biomedical, and even orthopedics. Um, we, have, we have some sports teams also quite interested in it. Um, again, what I love about this research is that I didn't really intend to do this, but it's, I, I've had to do it, uh, you know, develop these, these kinds of systems. Another thing which some of you might know is muscle activity. So that's like how much is a muscle being um, activated by your nervous system. So it's usually done with um, uh, electromyography, so that's where you put needles or surface electrodes on a subject. So obviously, it's, you know, you get wireless systems, but they're really expensive. Uh, they can only measure a finite number of muscles because you need one electrode per muscle. Uh, it's also invasive, so I've, I've seen this on my students. They need to be shaved <laughs> before you put it on. So we can't do this with a wild animal. So I thought, can we measure muscle activity remotely without touching the subject? And we can with millimeter wave radar. So here's my, my student. And, and what we did was we showed that with a millimeter wave radar, we can actually detect when the muscle is being activated from a distance. So this was really cool. We, we submitted a patent, patent on it. Um, but the next step now is for us to look at how can we handle moving subjects and also can we track multiple muscles at the same time? Anyway, back to, back to cheetahs. The last thing we want to do is get better data. So as you saw, it takes a bit of work to get the cheetahs to run. Sometimes they don't want to run. Sometimes they just want to lay under a tree. Um, but wild animals, if you've seen any wildlife documentary or come to South Africa to, you know, to see one of our wildlife parks, the animals, the cheetahs run. And because they have different motivations, right? they need to catch prey. So how can we do remote, so from a distance, whole body, skeletal body estimation? And the idea is to use sensor fusion. And this is what I got the Google um, award to do. I'm working with uh, Andrew Marker, my host at, at Oxford, is to do sensor fusion with a uh, telescopic RGB high-speed video camera and a solid-state LiDAR, and then do 3D reconstruction of animals from really far distances, like 200 meters away. So my, my students developed the system. We've deployed it now twice in uh, two of our national parks in South Africa. So that's a very cool photo of it at sunset. Um, this is what the system entails. Um, you know, LiDAR, like I said, cameras, uh, a screen. It has uh, an IMU on it as well. 
but I was really worried that maybe cheetahs weren't reflective <laughs> because many of the LIDARs are designed for, for cars, right? So met metallic objects. And we tested the system. You can see on the left, uh, I don't know how the laser works. Is it this? Oh, there we go. So you can see over there, the cheetah is actually quite bright in the point cloud, which is a good sign for me. So now we can do 3D reconstruction. Okay. So I said we deployed the system. We deployed it twice at Khalakhadi National Park. It's a big national park in South Africa on the border of South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia in Southern Africa. And we collected tons of data, lots of cool animals, lions you can see there. We even have springbok fighting. Um, so, but not only do we have cool videos, but we also have really cool uh, point cloud data, time synchronized, we can, which we can then um, fuse with that RGB. So you can see this is a giraffe. You can clearly make out the giraffe in the point cloud at the bottom there. And that's from about, that's about 150 meters away. So what we're now doing is doing this, the fusion of the LiDAR and the high speed um, video to then do the, the full skeletal motion. I, I didn't include this slide, but we're also doing mesh reconstruction, which I can talk about during the coffee break. Okay, then also on our first day, we were super lucky in that we caught a, a, a cheetah mother and a three cubs take down a spring box. So that's what you can see over there, there's the cheetah mother. One of the cubs comes along. On the right, you can see the point cloud. You can see them, which was a, a really cool story I can tell you about <laughs> later as well. So now, we, now we're busy doing the 3D reconstruction of that data. Okay, we're also doing some calibration. So some of you who do computer vision know that you normally work with a fixed focal length lens. You don't work with zooming cameras. So what we're working on now is self-supervised calibration. So we're using the LiDAR to calibrate um, the camera. So this is a lion. You can see walking over there. And here's the colorized point cloud. Over there you can see the lion quite nicely in the point cloud. Okay, in the last part, I promise I'll be finished soon. <laughs> the next challenge, right? So what is, the, what is, the, what is the, the biggest challenge for us? So I think some of you work in, well, many of you work in deep learning and there's been an explosion, I guess, from the time that I've left uh, undergraduate uh, in, in, in deep learning, especially in computer vision. And that can largely be, be attributed to the advent of GPUs for training large models. But also, I think the availability of large open access data, right? There's lots of, uh, for example, on human pose, there's human 3.6M, which is labeled data you can download and train whatever flavor neural network you want on it. So we don't have that for wildlife, for working with animals. That's always been the biggest challenge of ours, mainly because you've got an uncooperative subject, there's occlusions, varying backgrounds. Also, if you do manage to find a cheetah, they might not run because they don't have the same motivations. Um, so the, the, I think on the critical path for our work is data. Like we need better ground truth data. So we developed a system to do that called mul the M2S2, which is a multimodal sensor suite. It consists of a parabolic microphone. We've got a solid state LiDAR, thermal camera, a high speed camera, We've got an event camera also. So an event camera works by only sending the light pixel which has changed. So it's an asynchronous camera. Um, we also then have a millimeter wave radar. So this is some really, really recent work that we've done validating the system. So this is the cheetahs. You can see uh, these, all of this data is time synchronized and calibrated. I should use this. So you can see there's the LiDAR, there's the thermal. We also do low light things. So you can see in the RGB, you can't even see it. There's the thermal, LiDAR point cloud. Here's the cheetah running. See over there at the top. You have the point cloud again, thermal, the event. The event camera can pick up very high speed motions. So very, very cool. So in conclusion, yeah, so studying the cheetah and I guess wildlife in general, is, is quite challenging. It's a difficult problem. Um, but I like to think of it like the space race in that it really challenges us to innovate and come up with new ways of, you know, 
measuring things, modeling things, optimizing things, because there's a shortcoming in the current way that we have, we've been doing things. Um, and, and purely, like I said in that previous example, not because I set out to do it, but because I had to do it, um, that I needed to innovate. So yeah, that's it from me. Again, thank you so much for having me. It was lovely being here. Thank you so much. Again, a fascinating talk. Uh, congratulations on your work. Uh, let's ha have a seat and oh, let's, cool. let's talk for, for a moment. Um, uh, I will. I will allow you to ask <laughs> some questions, but let me let me take the privilege of having the mic. Um, so I, I really l love the, the conclusion that you made, and it's really inspiring how your uh, research results in new technologies and patents mm -hmm. and in uh, finding new important problems to address uh, and all that in those beautiful uh, environment and mm -hmm. uh, working with wildlife. Uh, congratulations on that. Um, uh, so uh, it's, uh, and thank, thank you very much for taking us uh, on that, your life journey actually. Yeah, your yeah, research yeah. journey, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I was really happy to, to see how you, you started with uh, uh, control theory and uh, studying uh, dynamical systems and feedback systems and in, uh, introducing that into these this models. Uh, how much does it still play uh, a role in what, what you're doing, the control theory or uh, studying dynamical systems from this classical point of view? Oh, yeah, that's a good question, yeah. I think so, so I'm always going to think of things in terms of feedback, I think. Uh, that's sort of my background. Um, so, for example, we, one of the first things that I saw coming out of the videos wasn't like the cool tail motion, it was the head motion. So if you look at the head from the videos, the head of the cheetah is like very, very still, despite the body moving around like quite a lot. And um, we actually analyzed that in, at, at some biology conferences and found out that there was a, there's actually a feedback controller going on there. And it's backed up by biology literature because the cheetah's inner ear is actually specialized for measuring high bandwidth, like accelerations and rotations. So it really, it's again, it's, it, I love when uh, sort of engineering, robotics can, can sort of like be found in nature. So I think that's always gonna, uh, it's always gonna stay with me. Yeah, it's uh, beautiful, uh, actually, so, uh, it's, it's more, even more beautiful because uh, my background is also in feedback control and, and uh, uh, I'm really very happy to see how uh, this beautiful mathematical theory uh, works in, in, in practice and allows you to explain uh, what, uh, what we see. What we see. Um, how good friends uh, are these cheetahs for you? <laughs> Are, do you have a personal relation with these <laughs> these animals? Um, I, I, no, no, not myself. I would say, like, yeah. So we we um, we don't really get to touch them, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, most of the sort of handling of the cheetahs gets done by the the trained uh, you know staff at the sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you've seen like we know the names of them. I feel like I feel like my students would say that they know them very well from labeling, you know, so many frames. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's uh, we we do see them quite often. Yeah, so yeah. And, uh, so uh, how when you so uh, geographically speaking, how far is it from uh, uh, Cape Town University? The 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 the, the uh, the place where cheetahs. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the so there's two places that we work with. Um, the one is Cheetah Outreach, which is about 20 minutes drive from from Cape Town, which is like nothing. <laughs> um, and the other one is up in Johannesburg, which is a, a different city in South Africa, which is about an hour flight. Um, so, so yeah, like very very close. Um, the national park is also about two hours flight, mm. and then uh, I think about uh, an hour drive. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, like having access to animals like that is really, I think, uh, that's that's our key selling point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, it's a great talk. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering because I'm also partially a biologist. I was wondering if the anatomy of the tail is so important to the movement of the cheetah, right? 
And you said yourself that uh, in the wild, uh, the wild types, so to say, uh, living outside the sanctuaries, the zoological gardens, and so on, move uh, much more. Do you see any phenotype changes in the in the tail between those wild types, uh, sanctuary kept, and the zoological garden? Uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, short answer is um, we haven't measured it, um, but I think uh, what what we can say is that the cheetahs in the wild are much faster. So um, our, our cheetahs, the, the fastest one we've measured is 18 meters per second, which I mean is still pretty fast. Um, but you know, in the wild, they've been measured at 29, 30 meters per second. Their mass is also much larger. So in the, in the wild, they can grow up to about 50 kilograms. And these cheetahs that we work with, uh, the, the captive bred ones are generally about 30, 30 kilograms. So their muscle, they're mus much more muscular. Definitely. <laughs> Any particular changes in the anatomy of the tail itself? Like w yeah, we, we haven't measured it okay. yet, unfortunately. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm doing a bit with MRI, so my first thing is to uh, catch one in the wild, <laughs> put this into the Step one, MRI catch, scanner. Catch cheetah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, I, would, I would love if to. If you have scholarships, I can come. <laughs> <laughs> you should come down, yeah, then we can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Do that, you will see the final research. Wonderful, Johnny. Congratulations. I'm an avid motorcycle driver, and uh, I face each day the risk of, you know, immediate braking. Did yeah. you consider using the results of your work on tail behavior? in the motorcycle industry? G good question. Um, I, so I think, I think a flywheel is still better for, uh, or the action wheel is better for a motorcycle, purely from a space perspective. Uh, I, I imagine having, having a tail and <laughs> eating the car next to you <laughs> wouldn't be so great. Um, but no, I mean, that's a good point. Uh, somebody, I, I remember when we wrote the article, sorry, when we did our first robot, they wrote an article and they said, F1 cars are gonna have these tails now. And everyone was like, <laughs> I was covering my face, like thinking, uh, no way. But um, there, there have been some studies though to show that um, tails are better for very short maneuvers. Um, so you get much larger angular impulse over a shorter dura duration of time. Whereas if you need a longer motion, for example, like in satellites, then the action wheel is still, is still better. I think, that, I think some, uh, I don't know if they're in production, but I know some experimental uh, motorbikes do have um, reaction wheels in them for stabilization. But uh, no tails on bikes yet. <laughs> <Unfortunately>. <laughs> you put one on your back maybe. <laughs> You showed uh, some really uh, demanding um, mathemat mathematical problems. Yeah. Which one was the most difficult? Uh, I think I think the contact implicit optimization is still really, you know, it, it's a it's an, a non-convex optimization that we're trying to do, and it's uh, you know it works when you give it a good seed. But I think that is like the holy grail that we still need to figure out. Um, I know that there's been a, a whole bunch of work now more in the reinforcement learning space mm -hmm. on um, using simulators like Mojoko and things like that. But I know that many of them don't give gradient information still, uh -huh. so or not good gradient information. So yeah, contacts are just very difficult, I think. Um, I would love to speak to some of the mathematicians <laughs> here about ideas on how to, how to solve that. But yeah, I mean, just by its nature, the problem is, is discontinuous. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when you have a, something hitting the ground um, and, and, yeah, figuring out a way. So we've tried, like, different ways to solve that. So we have it as a complementarity constraint. So mm -hmm. we, we, we try and, like, so we allow some force away from the ground. And then as we get closer to the solution, we make that, like, distance smaller until you can only have force on when you're on the ground, mm -hmm. um, which, again, like, works and you get cool motions. but a lot of times it doesn't work mm -hmm. and so yeah that that definitely is something to look at and when you are solving this uh, uh, class of problems or, or related uh, do you start with, with with a pencil or do you just go immediately to some 
global optimization or to do it backwards to figure out what the solution is based on some numerical um, mm -hmm. analysis. Yeah, I think I think we're still doing pen pen and paper stuff. Like I, I think in my group, we still um, we still try and understand the problem first before just trying like a data driven mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's uh, I think it's changing. My students are pushing back, and they want to do more deep learning and things <laughs> like that. So, um, but but yeah, I'm still kind of a bit old school in that way, mm -hmm. where I want to understand what's happening under the hood. Um, but yeah, I think I'm still pen to paper, kind of trying to figure it out there. There is a question from YouTube. So oh, also wow, to cool. prove all those who are watching uh, us on YouTube. Uh, Carolina is writing fantastic and captivating presentation. Thank you. Uh, what are the potential applications of the kind of research that are you doing for other areas in robotics and outside? Is it cybersecurity or maybe AI? And what other animals are studied for potential insights for robotics? Oh, interesting. Good question. Um, so, so if I understand the question, is it um, under which other animals are, are being studied? So, in, I guess. Um, I, sh I should premise this by saying that many of the things that I do are mainly to try and understand the cheetah, but the, but the, I guess the, the nice and, and surprising thing is that it comes out and spills over into other domains that I don't intend to originally. So um, originally, as you s like I showed you, my journey was like I wanted to do robotics, like I only cared about the robots, but now the systems that I'm developing you know, um, the motion capture systems, for example, have impact in biology, in sports science. Um, so we've done some work, you know, detecting concussions during rugby, you know, things like that. Um, uh, yeah, and, and also I guess the motion capture systems in general are applicable to a wide variety of animals. So we've, we've been working on a paper now where we are studying, you know, group dynamics of, um, you know, uh, Springbok. So as they're moving around, like could we track individuals, like how they how they're moving in 3D space again? So that's ecology things that I again I did not anticipate. Uh, in terms of animals, um, so I mainly work with with, with cheetahs, but uh, I know like some of my colleagues are starting to. Well, one of my one of my colleagues is very interested in looking at ostriches because we it's one of those things that we have in South Africa. <laughs> just walking, like, you know, you drive past a farm and there'll be a bunch of ostriches. So, um, yeah, looking at ostriches because they're actually bipedal. They're the fastest, like, bipedal running animal. So really, really interesting um, to look at. Again, and something that we have access to quite easily. Um, and then, yeah, there's actually a whole bunch of animals that we could, um, I guess, provide insight to with our system um, in, in the future. Uh, I think that the s sport applications might might be uh, in, in on the horizon of, of the patent, the patent that, that, that you, didn't yeah. you mention? Yeah, 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 definitely. So, so um, again, like uh, it's uh, it not something that I intended, but I um, got through my university, got put in touch with the sports science division, yeah. and and they like their eyes light, lit up when I yeah. started talking about and showing my systems. Mm -hmm. You know, basically. Uh, what what our um, our work does is it allows you to study biomechanics mm -hmm. outside of the lab, like you know, in an unconstrained way. So normally, what I would love is I want to be able to take a biomechanics lab, you know, into the field essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, like I said, like the motion capture stuff, uh, you know, the wild pose system that I showed with a lidar. I imagine you could use that for you know a sports like a match or something. You could do 3D. Uh, motion capture mm -hmm. of, of, of players as they move. You could track multiple players with a single view. Um, the force plate system, they're quite interested in it from the perspective of, um, you know, possibly uh, training on the side. You know, coaches are really interested in it again. Mm -hmm. not, I'm not really a sports person, to be honest, but, <laughs> but yes, I, I talk to a lot of sports people. <laughs> Another question on uh, YouTube. Uh, Ines is asking, could it also translate into studying human run and find application in, for example, developing better running shoes? Yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, Patent that, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so at the moment, um, 
low-cost uh, force plates are generally only single axis, and that's fine mm. for um, for um, you know many applications. But for if you're trying to do things like you know measuring gait and uh, things like um, pronation, like how your th your feet are rotating as you run, mm. you need to have 3D force and center of pressure because you need to know where that force is acting and you know how it's affecting the joints. So our system is definitely applicable to that. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I can't say too much on that, but we have th things like that in the pipeline. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> the man uh, in, the in a hat, cheetah, cheetah, cheetah hat. Cheetah. I appreciate that, thank yeah, you. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> like Claudia's shoes. <laughs> obliged to ask a question <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I want to refer to the animation I don't know if you put it on purpose because actually you have two models there yes one with uh, rigid uh, yes. backbone uh, and tile and the other with flexible one yeah. do you find it uh, so mm, important uh, does, does it make much improvement make much change in, into the quality of modeling when you use flexible spine model? flexible spine or flexible tail both Okay, so yeah, from the from the spine perspective, uh, definitely like so we've got had a few papers where we've shown that having a flexible spine increases like maneuverability dramatically. Um, uh, the tail, the jury's still out on on you know having a flexible tail or not actually helps. One thing I can show uh, say sorry is if you saw in the videos that what often happens is when our tail reaches the end of its stroke, so we it's about to hit the body. If the tail is moving too fast, it will hit the body and undo all of the stabilization that you just did. Whereas where we see in the cheetahs quite a few times, and I know there's some researchers working on um, kangaroo rats, so like really small kangaroo rats with, with long tails, is that when they flick, when they get to the end of the stroke, they actually bend and curl the tail in. So that's definitely something we want to explore. Purely, I sh that video is to just show the initial sort of uh, analysis that we've done. But it, I think it, I think it's super important, yeah. Because there's another another thing that I didn't mention is that when I did that autopsy <laughs> sentence, I never thought I'd say, but <laughs> is that is that there's quite a few um, tendons down the down the tail. So there's also a bit of flexibility. So I'm not sure how much compliance is an issue is an issue or can assist the cheetah as well. Because another thing that we have on the on the robots is when the tail strikes the ground is that you can also flip the robot over again because it basically transfers all that momentum back into the body. Um, whereas if you had a flexible tail and you hit the ground, it could uh, absorb and dampen some of that impact. So again, um, interesting things to explore. Yeah. Thank you for this uh, explanation, the deep explanation of the role of the tail. Uh, I want to return to the question of spine. Sure. Because uh, it happens that I, uh, I cooperate with sports uh, coaches and they, this is about, uh, let's say, the quality of modeling or mm. the, the mm, in models that are changing with time. I mm. mean, uh, those people, I mean the trainers, okay, the, the, the coaches, uh, uh, complain about the quality of spine in uh, youth players. Uh, they, they say that because of their screen time, because of their habits, their low doses and kyphosis are diminishing, yeah. and the, the quality, are, you, you know, the, the elasticity of the spine uh, changes. Mm. Yes, with, uh, and this is irreversible. So maybe in some aspect it, it refers to the previous question by Ines uh, that uh, about the, the modeling, the usefulness in modeling. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the general op my observation is that you have to take into account, uh, let's say, uh, slow changes of human body, uh, which are important uh, in the process of design, the process of healing, training, anything. Mm. That's, 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 that's all. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. May I ask you, because I think I also have right to ask the question, oh, the having my you, cheetah yeah. shoes, yes, so the same as Mariusz. So I want to ask you about, maybe that will be weird, but I want to ask you about your dreams, because when, whenever I imagine the, the researcher, there is always a, um, 
image in my mind that the, that there are researchers saying like eureka at certain time, mm -hmm. and then they they feel that you know may, maybe you then you would feel like okay it's a mission accomplished, I'm done, and then I can move from cheetah to, to completely some different animal. aspects. And yeah. I want to ask you like where this uh, where is this eureka for you? Um, I think I think if we can do what I showed on the one slide. Um, well, I'd have to go very far back, but essentially, if we can show or everything that you can do inside a lab, I want to be able to do that outside. Um, sorry, it's taking oh. me a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> um, here we go. If we can, if we can do it, this on a wild animal without touching it then I will be very happy. <laughs> but I think that's like, yeah, 10, 10 years away maybe. Yeah. But I think, yeah, if we can, I th if we can study animals as if you, you know, have them inside a lab and you can measure every single thing um, in, a, in, a, in, a most, in the most unobtrusive way, so, you know, without changing their behavior, I think that, that, that's sort of what I'm working towards. Because I think the days of us... Um, you know, putting things on the animal are, are, are gone because it's so risky, like to anesthetize the animals, they are endangered, all those kinds of things. And you don't get all the information that you need. So I think we need to be doing these things from afar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, one. Sure. <laughs> As I can see, a lot of cu curiosity. And also, you're a very like, interesting person and researcher. I know that you're also, uh, you're also teaching, and you have many students that you take care of in the lab. And I want to ask you, how do you, uh, how do you work all together? So what's your work, cooperation? How do you collaborate? Like, how do you, you know, squeeze all their experience and interests to make these fantastic things? You mean in terms of my teaching? Or? Yeah, you're teaching and working in the teams, in a lab, yeah. uh, in, the, in, the, in the unit. Yeah, well. so, so I mean, there's two aspects to that. So I do quite a lot of uh, undergraduate teaching lectures and so on. Um, and I teach you know, mechanical modeling and so on. And what I try and do quite a lot is to uh, contextualize the things that I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I was, we spoke about this earlier, and I, said, I was an undergrad sitting there doing all this maths and, it, and I didn't see the point to all of it. But when you, know, you explain something, this is this mechanical equation and it can make you understand how an airplane moves, for example, then I think people, they start listening. So I think for me, I always try and bring my experience in, into my teaching. So I, I worked quite a bit in, in aerospace also before I came and did my PhD. And I always try and bring, you know, that kind of, this is, how, this is what a feedback controller does <laughs> to an aircraft. Or, um, so, and I think, I guess on a, on a broader scale, that's how we are going to continue making lectures useful for students. Because otherwise, there's so many videos online they could watch you know for example on you know feedback control again or mechanical modeling or why would they want to come to your lecture you know Mira's lecture because they'd want to hear about your experience and when you actually applied this thing in a real system i think i, I like to think of it as war stories like <laughs> i tried this thing and it you know it went unstable because i made this assumption and i think that's the kind of stuff that i always see in my course evaluations that stick out with the students. Um, yeah, and then in terms of, I guess my students is just, I don't know, I think I'm just excited. I always tell my students that uh, if I had time, I would do each and, each and every one of these projects myself, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, very, I'm a very passionate, uh, I guess I'm quite hands-on supervisor. I think, I'd, again, I told you I'm, I'm in the lab every day, um, you know, just not, like policing them, but you know, being there to assist and wanting to be involved. So, yeah, I think I think they like that. I think that results future plans. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions uh, left? Ah. Okay. a question about your last project about this box with sensors that yes. you uh, because this uh, box a, a lot of sensors probably very expensive yeah and so what additional information do you expect to obtain from it about the cheetah 
good, good question. Okay, so I guess the, the main purpose of, the, of that system is to provide ground t truth data. So at the moment, um, you know, human modeling uh, of, in terms of computer vision can be done because there's, um, you know, there's multi-camera data or uh, um, depth information, for example. So you can train a neural network to do monocular, you know, human pose estimation easily. So we don't have anything like that for cheetahs or wildlife in general. So that's sort of what I wanted to do with the system is that show that you could do for, you know, there's so many different like ways you could look at it, but monocular is one aspect. The other side is what about low light conditions, right? So what if you have uh, a camera, how, what's the best way to look at motion of animals during, you know, uh, the dawn or dusk, because that's when the animals are most active. Um, yeah, there's the other side of also fusing the data. Like, so fusing thermal data or radar data together can make it better or more accurate information. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me close up this wonderful talk with one final question. Uh, your favorite discovery uh, <laughs> throughout this journey. Oh yeah, th that's easy. Like so, so the it was the one that surprised me the most was that the cheetah, the cheetah's tail is lighter than mm. expected. Like uh, it was, at first horrified me because I <laughs> was like two thirds of the way into my PhD with this idea of <laughs> heavy tails, and I remember phoning my supervisor and like having a uh, crisis, and you know, but uh, but I think also just. Yeah, like the taking the risk and seeing like, oh, but I wonder what it does in a wind tunnel, <laughs> which is a crazy idea. But yeah, I think that was a, was a very cool discovery. <laughs> Congratulations on that. And thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Thank you, Neil.